So, uh, how many of you, this is your first trip to Embedded Linux Conference or Android Builder Summit? Most of you. Wow, okay, good. Yeah, I've been uh, speaking at Embedded Linux Conference now since 2007, and uh, Android Builder Summit, when they started having those, I started speaking at those as well. Uh, I've spoken on a lot of different topics. Uh, most notably, I was a keynote, um, I guess it was two years ago, on talking about the Internet of Things, what uh, Tim was talking about. And we're seeing a lot of changes that are happening, especially to some of the mainline operating systems like Android and uh, how it plays with the real world. I mean, it's really interesting. And that's, that's really what's going to be the topic of this particular discussion. Uh, we've still got another couple minutes for people to come in. But when we take a look at how much progress Android has been able to make over the past uh, relatively few years. I mean, we're only talking, uh, what's four years? Well, 2007 was when uh, uh, Google acquired uh, the, uh, the Android folks from uh, what used to be Danger, Inc. And they've made some pretty big strides. They've had their hiccups. Of course, we all know about the problem that came about when Google decided they were going to go off and do their kernel and not interface with the rest of the real uh, Linux community. Uh, I was very fortunate to have gotten a Google Nexus 1 as a we're sorry gift from Android, uh, from the Google folks. They showed up at the Embedded Linux conference and said, they had two pallets of cell phones, and they go, we're really sorry we screwed up the kernel community. Would, here, take this. And maybe this will help assuage your uh, ruffled feathers. It did, for a little while at least, until it was, until I couldn't upgrade the phone anymore. And then it's like, okay, well, it's a nice little handset, but not much else. All right, well, we are currently on time, so let's get working here. My name is Mike Anderson, and I'm a chief scientist for the PTR group. We're a small 35-person engineering firm. We do a lot of custom work for uh, not only commercial organizations, but also the government in, related, in relation to porting Android, porting Linux to new platforms. So one of the major things that we're starting to see is that as Linux starts to become, and, and Android, of course, obviously, starts to become so pervasive, we're now in a position where management is coming into a new project and saying, what I really want is I want to be able to have this really cool GUI sitting on top of everything, and I still need to be able to do all my real-time control. I still need to be able to do all my embedded systems work, but I want to use this uh, Android front end. And it, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it from the perspective of how much does it cost to actually deploy something, uh, in particular training. And in many cases, we tend to neglect training as an aspect of all of this because training doesn't really factor into the calculations all that much until you really start thinking about how am I going to ship a product? What do I have to do in order to be able to get the user experience in such a way that I don't have to have a support desk to sit there and answer phone calls saying, I don't know how this works. So fortunately, one of the things that's happened for us uh, and, and I really have uh, uh, the guys at Apple, I, I really say thanks to those guys because they did a lot to establish the whole concept of the swipe and the pinch and zoom and everything uh, in everybody's mind so that now if you take a look at the install base for smartphones and tablets, uh, it's billions of devices. Uh, we see that now actually here in the United States, the carriers when you see T-Mobile, for instance, getting ready to, to buy basically your contract out from Verizon or somebody else in order to get you as a subscriber, the reason they're willing to do that is because they've hit 95% saturation of the market. 95% of all of the people who could buy smartphones have them. There is no more market to be had. There is no new niche to push into if you're a smartphone vendor. However, as Tim indicated in the, uh, the discussion that we just had in the keynote, there are new markets that we can push into with Android. And that's the key of what we're going to be talking about here in this presentation. 
So we'll take a quick look about Android, at Android in the outside world and, and how we deal with devices in the outside world. We'll look at strategies for adding new sensors. Now the traditional Android approach and then the approach that we're going to talk about in more detail here which is adding uh, external microprocessors. Uh, we'll briefly touch on what does it mean if we would to say that we had a real-time Android. What exactly would that be? And why, uh, leading from the real-time Android, why we need to seriously consider the use of external microprocessors for doing most of the work. Then we'll take a look at some interesting approaches. One is to actually write code for the microprocessor or the microcontroller. The other is this kind of weird approach called Fermata uh, that uh, you basically turn the external microprocessor into a dumb peripheral versus using it to actually do some intelligent processing. A couple of different strategies there. So let's uh, kind of move forward here. Yeah. Uh, yes, they should be. Uh, I, I, gave them to the, I gave them to the Linux Foundation. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you should be able to download these. If not now, shortly. But, uh, and of course, it, it, you can always send me email, mike at the ptrgroup.com. If for whatever reason you can't find it, then uh, by all means, send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. All right, so how does Android deal with devices today, that is physical sensors and things of that sort. Well, Android in Lib Sensors has got an implementation for many of the most common sensors that we'll encounter in a cell phone, uh, in a smartphone. We've got gyros and accelerometers and a compass and a GPS and all that sort of stuff. All of that's integrated in through Lib Sensors and the sensor how. So the hardware abstraction layer is there specifically to try and abstract the details of the Linux hardware driver implementation from how the user will see this device in the Java framework. Adding a new sensor to the platform, let's say we've picked a sensor that does not exist. Uh, we want to do something through I squared C. And there is no existing sensor that uses that particular interface that's available on our phone. How would we go about adding that? Well, normally that would mean that if we were to going to pick a sensor, say a heart rate sensor for heartbeats and heartbeat monitoring, I mean, we're starting to see a lot of this stuff happening now for Android in the medical community where they want to have the equivalent of a Holter monitor for those of you who ever had heart monitoring done for you. Well, the Holter monitor, they put all kinds of little electrodes on you and then they have a little recorder, which is literally a cassette tape recorder, and it sits there and it records your heartbeat over multiple days. And then they play that back through and they kind of digitize it and look at it and go, oh, well, he's got a problem with arrhythmia or whatever. Well, if we were to have something like that that would be implanted inside of someone we're interested in monitoring 24-7 and had that then tied to his smartphone, uh, and I say he in the sense of the generic third person sense of the word, not male versus female, but um, have it keyed to their smartphone so that if we think about how to resuscitate someone who's having a heart attack, there is this thing called the golden hour. And if you can get medical care within the golden hour, the first hour after the event actually occurs, chances of survival are outstanding. Every minute past the end of the golden hour, things start to deteriorate pretty quickly. So if we had a way of adding a sensor to Android so that when that heart attack first occurs, it immediately reaches out and contacts the doctor. It determines, based on the GPS location, the closest hospital and contacts emergency care facilities so that they can then reach out and have somebody there within that first hour. That would be a tremendously powerful tool. However, in order to add such a sensor to Android, we would have to download the AOSP sources. We would have to go in and modify lib sensors. We'd have to add an, a, a Linux driver to the kernel. Uh, we would then have to physically figure out how we're going to connect it. Uh, all of those things come into play here where we might be able to do it for a single phone or a single platform. But the chances of us being able to do that for every phone, very slim. 
So how do we then say, all right, how do we add a sensor outside of the Android open source platform? And uh, how do we get it integrated in in such a way that we don't have to make major modifications to the actual handset or the tablet in order to extend it for this new capability? So it turns out that the real world is filled with this kind of stuff. Uh, we've got CAN bus. We've got uh, A to D's, digital to analogs. We've got I squared C. Uh, motor controllers, a lot of those use PWM, pulse width modulation. So uh, I squared C, of course, obviously, SPI, TWI, lots of different connectors, lots of different interfaces out there. And the question is, how do I get those things wired to the physical sensor and then how do I get the Android platform to be able to support them? Well, we could create custom hardware. I mean, I could make a connector that's going to wire the I squared C out in some reasonable fashion so that you could then plug in a new sensor that was based on I squared C technology and be able to attach it to the Android platform physically. But once I get past the physical attachment, then I need to go in and make some modifications to the Android kernel, and I need to make modifications to Android's HAL as well as lib sensors in order to make all of this stuff function. Unfortunately, the Linux kernel uh, that they use in Android isn't really tuned even for soft real time. Uh, we're not running the preempt desktop. Uh, the desktop preemption uh, model. We're using voluntary preemption for the most part. So that's not going to give me terribly good, even soft real-time performance. So if I'm trying to sense things in the real world in real time, um, I'm not going to be able to get there with the out-of-the-box Android platform. So we have some other options here. Uh, Android, of course, natively supports Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, USB, and NFC in some instances, depending on whether you've got the NFC hardware out there. So using one of these connections, we could potentially interface an external device and then offload all the time-sensitive work, offload all of the uh, expensive real-time constraint kinds of work off to the external microprocessor and then simply use Android as a front end, a data collection platform, a user interface, uh, something that would be a communications interface, for instance, that might then reach out to the uh, service provider so that we can then have medical uh, community dispatched. So we have some kind of conflicting goals here, though. Uh, we would love to be able to keep our costs down. We want to be able to add this new feature, add this new sensor, whatever, to an Android platform, but not end up extremely uh, making the Android platform more expensive. We don't want to have to redesign the hardware. We don't want to have to spend thousands of man hours going in and, well, hopefully not thousands, but at least hundreds of man hours, uh, going in, modifying the Android open source project, writing the, driver, the drivers, modifying the HAL, getting all that stuff built, rebuild the OS, et cetera, et cetera. We'd like to be able to reduce the cost, but still be able to guarantee service. And that's where uh, we really find, and this was the thing that, that uh, uh, Tim was alluding to in the keynote, having two big processors sitting out there. That is, having an ARM Cortex-A15 quad-core and an ARM Cortex-A8 sitting out there in the sensor, that's a lot of money. Those, even the Cortex-A8s, are still pretty expensive processors. And they have fairly large RAM requirements cooling requirements, power requirements, the whole swap thing, uh, size, weight, power, uh, all come into play. So we really want to be able to do something with a very small controller that can provide us the real-time control, provide us the ability to do what we need to do, but not duplicate everything that's in the Android platform. We want to use Android for what it's made for, not necessarily for doing all this external control. So uh, there have been, oh, power, oh, yeah, it's down here. They have it squirreled away. There you go. Uh, so we have a couple of things that we could do. We could 
if we're really trying to do some real-time embedded kinds of things for Android, we could say, well, let's extend Android. And there's actually some folks at uh, University of uh, well, Buffalo.edu uh, who are working on how you would make Android real-time capable. Now, making a real-time capable Android is not a trivial thing. Uh, even with all the work that we've done in Linux with the preempt RT kernel, that's not enough in order to make it play in some reasonable way for Android. Uh, we have really, you know, when we ask somebody what is real time, and I actually have seen a video where they went through and they kind of interviewed a whole bunch of people, what is real time, what is embedded, nobody could really come up with a satisfactory answer as it turns out, uh, because it depends on who you talk to, but the reality is that real time basically means we have computing with a deadline. And the question is, what happens if we miss the deadline? If we just miss the deadline and we go on to the next sample period, okay, that's soft real time. If we miss the deadline and the wings fall off the airplane, that's hard real time. So, you know, we have to understand what the consequences are of missing the deadline. And there have been a lot of attempts that have been made for Android trying to make it real time capable. So there have been folks that have gone through, rebuilt the kernel for Android, turn on preempt RT, uh, turn on all the wonderful features that are part of the uh, real-time patch, and uh, be able to support soft real-time with reasonable efficiency uh, inside of the Android kernel itself. If we were using an NDK application, Native Development Kit application in C or C++, then we actually might be able to achieve some reasonable level of, of service. Yeah? Are there some parts of the Android-specific kernel, though, which don't take into account preempt RT type stuff? Yeah. Uh, fortunately, most of the things that are in the kernel right now, the ones that you'd be most concerned with would be AshMem uh, and the binder. Um, those seem to behave OK with preempt RT turned on. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I have not sat there and stressed them to any significant level. It's been like a turn them on, oh wow, the kernel doesn't crash. That's good. You know, we'll say that's success, but that's unfortunately not enough. Uh, the big problem, uh, the, the kernel itself doing real time, that's really not the big issue here. The big issue is the entire Android framework. The Android framework. Uh, in spite of all the fact that all the people that have looked at this, I mean, and we've had some really talented developers looking at the Android framework quite a long time now. But the problem is that the Dalvik VM is still a VM. Uh, it is optimized for particular types of behavior. It's optimized to make a handset, a smartphone, a tablet, behave well for user interaction. But any time there's a human in the loop, we immediately have soft real time, at best. Because I don't care how fast you blink the, the plane's going to fall apart light. If the user is drinking a cup of coffee and they don't notice it, the plane falls apart. You know, there's nothing there that we can use in order to enforce the Dalvik VM to do what it's supposed to do. I mean, we have the advantages that the Dalvik VM is not a stack-based VM, it's a register-based VM. There's a lot of things that they've done the garbage collection has been made better than we had in a typical Java. But realize that the real-time Java community, when they say real-time, their target is one millisecond. That's their target. And one millisecond is good for a lot of problems. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of things like motor control that it's not good for. Because at motor control, we start talking about 400 kilohertz and faster refresh rates in order to keep the motor spinning correctly. So there has actually been these guys at uh, University of Buffalo have looked at uh, replacing Dalvik and putting in a real-time Java implementation. But uh, they quickly found that that was not a viable option. Uh, the amount of effort that they were going to have to go through in order to make this work was just too onerous. So they may, re they may revisit it. Don't, I mean, they're a university, and you know, you university, you have lots of cheap, la I mean, slave, la uh, yeah, cheap labor. You have uh, graduate students, and so you can use that in order to research things that would normally not be economically feasible in the real world. 
But whether they'll come back to that or not, I don't know. They're certainly looking at it. Yeah. Well, what about Android's new runtime ART that, you know, 4.4, uh, you can replace Dolby with ART? Right. So that does a lot more for you. Um, whether or not, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to sit and actually characterize the performance of that. Because you have to do it in light of having the preempt RT kernel in place. So it's not just a, oh, I'm going to turn on ART and it's going to solve my problems. It's, no, no, I have to turn on the preempt RT kernel. I got to rebuild the kernel. I got to turn on ART. I got to see how they interact with each other. A lot of stuff has to happen in order for us to even come close to being able to say we've even tested it sufficiently. Yeah. yeah OK, leaving that part aside, if you're not using Dolby VM, you're basically ignoring all the Android user applications, right? Correct. And if you're doing that, then why not just use an ordinary embedded Linux? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the reason that you still use the Android piece of it is because what you would like to do is you'd like to be able to get the whole pinch, zoom, sweep, swipe, all that sort of user interface, the user experience part. You run the NDK underneath it, and it turns out that they've made a lot of extensions, starting with Ice Cream Sandwich. They started making more and more extensions for the NDK. So that now when you're looking at games and a lot of the really high speed applications under Android, they're really not running in Dalvik. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we have to really understand when we talk about embedded and real time, they are not one and the same. We have to realize that an embedded computer is basically anything that you inherently know. There must be a computer in there somewhere, but you're just not quite sure where. That's an embedded platform, that camera right there. Uh, we have TV sets. We have printers. We have routers. All of these devices, we inherently know there's a computer in there somewhere, but there's no keyboard mouse monitor interface to that thing. Now, on my TV, there's a little jack on the back of it that says console. And if you understand how to hook up your bus pirate, you can then figure out that it's a serial port console that gets into the TV set. But my wife takes a very dim view of me hacking our TV set while she's watching it, especially. Oh, this won't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll have to reboot. You know, um, TV set. Where is the control alt delete on the TV set anyway? Oh, yeah. All right. So the embedded space is actually quite a bit larger than the real time space, and the real time space just simply means we're focusing on deterministic behavior. Now, determinism isn't necessarily faster, and that's one of the kind of the interesting problems that we run into with the preempt RT patch, because we can get very deterministic behavior out of preempt RT with a little bit of tuning, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's faster than the non preempt RT patched kernel. It turns out in many cases it's just deterministic, it just takes the same amount of time every time. And we're willing to trade performance against determinism in the real-time world. So then if we have the kind of intersection between real-time and embedded, now we have airbag deployment, anti-lock breaks. Those kinds of applications fall into this, well, it's an embedded application, certainly. There's no keyboard, mouse, and monitor on your airbag deployment. It has to be real-time because it turns out that uh, there was an issue many, many years ago where airbags on the, on the passenger seat were uh, killing people because it turns out that the airbag on the passenger seat was a little bit further away than it was on the driver's side, and they were using the same timing constraints. So you were a lot further forward when the airbag deployed, and it <laughs> cut your neck and snapped it. Bad problem. So uh, we see those kinds of applications are really the intersection of real time and embedded. Well, it turns out there's a whole bunch of those kinds of problems that exist out in the world. And we would like to be able to leverage what Android does, but still be able to guarantee that we can meet our performance requirements. So if we take a look at an out of the box Android device, it really isn't capable of doing deadline based computing without significant modifications. And even if we did do the modifications, we've modified one Android platform, not all Android platforms. So that's a big problem for us if we're trying to turn this into a marketplace, especially in the medical community. 
So we'd like to be able to offload all the real-time constraints. We'd like to be able to offload all the weird electrical interfaces out of Android to something else and then let Android provide the UI and the user experience. This is where the microcontrollers start coming in. So what are we talking about with an external microcontroller or a microprocessor, depending on where, where you went to school? There are a lot of very popular ones that are out there. They're either 8, 16, or 32-bit, depending on which versions we pick. Some of them may have a real-time operating system on them. A lot of them don't. A lot of them are running bare metal. So when you're running bare metal on top of a platform, you really have to understand how that platform, the boot sequence, you have to understand how it initializes code, you have to understand what it's going to run, does it have multitasking, is it interrupt driven, is it a super loop, what is it? So it definitely implies some issues in terms of understanding how the platform runs, but there are a lot of really popular ones out there. We see the Arduino, uh, this is the Atmel AVR processors, uh, the PICs, PIC24, PIC32s, uh, MSP430s. There are a lot of these little microcontrollers out there, and they are selling for dirt cheap. When Tim was talking about not having a $50 CPU, but having a $0.10 cent CPU, these are the kinds of CPUs he's talking about, $0.10 cent CPUs and less. So some of these are really, really cheap. Um, you can buy you know, full-up development platforms for MSP430 for $5. That's the board, the chip, the IDE tools, everything for five bucks. Where? Launchpad. Launchpad, yep. I've got uh, three or four of them. When they come out that cheap, I'll, get, I'll buy them, and then I'll give them to my students. I, I, I'm a software mentor for a robotics team, on a high school robotics team. So I'll buy a bunch of them, and I'll just kind of give them to the students and say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make the robot have blinky lights on it. Here's some LEDs, here's some resistors, here's some wires, here's the controller, here's the development environment, go for it. And we see how many of them uh, are successful. And those that are successful, I want on my software squad. Those that aren't successful, I send them to frame and bumper. <laughs> you should really help these mechanical guys over here. All right, so the problem is that each one of these things has got its own kind of development environment along with it. Here's some examples. This is the launch pad uh, from TI. We have the Arduinos, of course. This one is an ARM Cortex-M3. That one's from uh, NXP. And then we have the yo-yo board here. Um, some of these have actually been modified specifically to deal and work with Android. And that's really one of the cool things. Because we really have two different approaches to the problem here. One is we can write code to run on the, micro code, uh, on the microprocessor. That means we have to have the compiler, we have to understand the development environment, we have to understand the boot sequence and things of that sort. And then we write the code and we run it on the microprocessor and the microprocessor handles the real-time constraints for us. It handles the I.O., the weird funky little uh, I squared C and those other kinds of I.O.s that are coming off the boards in many cases. And does so in its own unique API. So you're not gonna be able to leverage your Linux experience here. It's gonna be something completely different. This gives us the ability to offload work and use the microprocessor as a, an intelligent buffer. And then simply give commands or give information, give data back over to the Android side so the Android can make command and control decisions, whereas all the real work is being done in the microprocessor. Yeah, good question. So uh, are you talking about the ADK? Partially, yes. And we'll get to that in just a second, because the ADK was something that Google did that unfortunately, it really hasn't taken off. And that's un that is really unfortunate, because it had a lot of potential. Um, and a lot of it was because, well, we'll, we'll, get to the, we'll get the reason why in just a second. All right, uh, there is an alternative approach, and there's this thing called Fermata. In the, in the Arduino world, they call it Fermata. Uh, basically, it's a special type of firmware. And we'll get to what that is in just a second. So here we've got some example development environments. This is, this is the Arduino development environment over here. Uh, we have the launch pad development environment. This is based on Eclipse. So there's a lot of different IDEs, a lot of different GUIs. Uh, they can run in Windows. They can run in OS X. They can run in Linux in many cases. 
it just depends on, you, you basically you buy into a religion here. If you're going to use Arduinos, you're buying into the Arduino approach. If you're going to use PIC 24s or PIC 32s, you're buying into microchips approach. If you're going to use the MSP 430, you're buying into TI's approach. So you end up having to kind of say, hey, this looks like an easy one for me to work with. I'm going to go this direction. Maybe it's the right direction. Maybe it isn't. Maybe you have to change it a little bit later, but at least you got something started. So I mentioned this thing called Fermata. It's actually, uh, there's an open website out there. It's an open standard. Uh, the microcontroller world, especially the Arduino guys, support this thing called Fermata. And what it does is it's a firmware that has a serial port interface on it. And it simply waits for a command. And the command says which port you want to talk to and what value you want to read or write to that port. So it basically, it takes the microcontroller and turns it into a dumb peripheral. Everything is done over on the Android side. The Android sends the command to it. The peripheral just simply does what Android told it to do. The uh, pluses and minuses of this are, first of all, uh, with Fermata and, of course, the Yo-Yo board, which comes specifically for the ADK, um, uses, a, uses this basic same approach. It's not the same code, unfortunately. It's not compatible, but it's the same concept. Um, the advantage of doing something like this is that I now don't have to write code for the microcontroller. Basically, the microcontroller has one firmware load and one firmware load only, and all of the real work has to be done over on the Android side. Of course, that doesn't solve our problem of real-time constraints, because Android is still decidedly non-real-time, but at least it solves our electrical interface problem. How do I generate a PWM signal? How do I deal with a 12-bit A to D? Those kinds of things can be done with Fermata, and I don't have to write any special code on the Android side to make that happen. I just need to be able to communicate to the device that's running Fermata. And there are a lot of them out there. If you go out onto the Google Play Store, you'll find a lot of these applications that are built specifically to deal with this kind of interface. So it's popular enough that there are probably 30 different apps out on the App Store that all work this way. Yeah. So um, it's a little unclear to me. So are these all going over the USB communication, or it can be different kinds? It can be different. A lot of them actually go through Bluetooth. OK. And that's because that's kind of the easiest thing to get running with Fermata. Um, the um, the Yo-Yo board can use either USB or Bluetooth. We'll talk about connections here in just a second. Yeah. Is Fermata intended to be a specific implementation or a generic term? Well, it is a specific implementation that has become generic. It's like Xerox. We used to say we're going to Xerox something. Now it's just kind of become a generic term. Firmware, or can many things be Fermata firmware? W many things can be Fermata firmware. It's an open source project. So you can actually download the source code to Fermata and port it to another platform. I've seen somebody who's ported it to the Raspberry Pi, for instance. There's a spec. Yep. There's a spec for the protocol, and it's a serial type protocol. And this is one of the things we start to see more and more often, even when we're dealing with things like USB in the Android Accessory Development Kit, it's all about serial type communications. So for those of you who have never dealt with serial ports before, well, you're going to have to learn about serial ports. Because whether they're Bluetooth or they're uh, USB, they're going to look like a serial port. And that's why in Bluetooth, it's actually called SPP, the Serial Port Profile in Bluetooth. Because it basically takes everything and makes it look like a serial port. So should you program the microcontroller, or should you use Fermata? Well, there are a couple of rules in embedded development work. Number one rule in embedded in real time is never trust the user. Always assume that the user will do the worst possible thing to you at the worst possible time and program that way. And that will minimize, not eliminate, but minimize the chances of you having a catastrophic failure in the system. The second rule of real-time development is no matter what your management asks you, the answer is always, well, it depends. Management hates this answer. But unfortunately, it's really the only answer we can give when we're dealing with embedded in real-time applications. Because it almost always depends on something. Do we have enough memory? Do we have enough bandwidth of the CPU? 
Is the bus working correctly? There are so many factors that come into play in trying able to meet deadline or constraint-oriented computing that there's no guarantee until we try it. And then we may find that we need to tweak this bus setting somewhere. Maybe the read, modify, write cycle isn't working correctly, whatever. Crazy stuff happens. Uh, using the Fermata approach is a quick and easy, quick and dirty way of doing something. You don't have to worry about the microcontroller. You basically abstract it and make it a dumb peripheral. Uh, but that means that now you're going to be doing a lot more programming on the Java side or on the Android side, whether you're using the NDK or you're using Java. And you're going to have the electrical interface, but you're not going to have the real-time capabilities that you would have if you program the microcontroller. If we program the microcontroller, then we can use the microcontroller for interrupts. We can use the microcontroller for all kinds of things. But it means that we have to learn a new environment. And then interface between the microcontroller environment and the Android environment. So how do I connect to the microcontroller? Well, serial ports are definitely there. Almost all of these little microcontroller boards have got a serial port on them. Uh, whether uh, One of the things we need to watch out for these serial ports is they're often not level shifted. That is, they are TTL level signals. They are not compatible with RS-232 voltages. So you cannot simply plug the wires into your nine port serial board and expect it to not blow the microprocessor up. So you go to places like SparkFun, Adafruit, a lot of these vendors out on the web sell little level shifter boards that will go from TTL level voltages to normal RS-232 voltages. Yeah. Does this do much uh, run into things like 3.3 volts, 1.8 volts? Yes. And that's the other tricky part about it. And actually, uh, this afternoon I'll be doing a presentation on how you build a Linux-based robot. And it's that 3.3 versus 5 volt thing that came back and bit me nastily. Um, had, because it has to do with the Beagle board. And the Beagle board likes 3.3 volt and my interfaces were 5 volt. So. I had to interpose an Arduino between the two in order to get them to play nicely. Um, we'll talk about that this afternoon, though. So we see a lot of things. 802.15.4, that's Zigbee, quote unquote. Actually, today, it's becoming 6-low pan. Now, 6-low pan is IPv6 over low performance wide area networks, which is why it's 6-low pan. With 6 low pan, we're starting to see this show up in SCADA implementations. Now, SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. It's basically in the industrial process control business. So if you make petroleum, if you do chemicals, if you do anything that requires process control of any significant way, you run into SCADA systems. So we're starting to see 802.15.4 show up in SCADA. Uh, USB, of course, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, all of these have some native connection to a lot of these microcontroller boards. And regardless of the transport layer, whether we're using Bluetooth or serial or USB, they all boil down to serial communications. It's always, I'm going to format a message, I'm going to send it across the serial link, it's going to be intercepted by the microcontroller, interpreted, the microcontroller will do something with that message, and then send you a message back that you then have to decode. There's no standard in the way those messages are written, you decide what the standard is for your application. Now, oh, one other thing. Some of these devices have Wi-Fi interfaces and Ethernets available for them. In those cases, they look like sockets. So that's another option that a lot of people pick because sockets are easy to understand, and I can go out on the web and I can see billions of examples of how it's done. We end up with something that's basically a nearly universal connection. And it's really driven by the size and pervasiveness of the Arduino ecosystem. There are over a billion Arduinos in place today. They have been around for a long time, and many of these third-party boards have actually adopted the Arduino pinout as a way of being able to leverage the Arduino mezzanine cards called shields. So we actually end up, there are a little over 300 different shields that are available. And that's a real working system, by the way. Looks like somebody reinvented PC-104. Uh, similar idea, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, except these are much smaller than PC-104. And we don't have to pay any licensing royalty rights. Because this is all open source hardware. 
So the Arduino is open source, the Shields are open source, everything is open source. You can get, download the Gerbers, you can make it yourself, it's great. So there are a lot of Shields that are available, MIDI, SD card, LCDs, you name it. It's probably got a Shield available for it. And there's some really cool things that are happening uh, that use these Shield pinouts. I'll talk about those in just a second. So here's the typical Arduino pinout. We have power over on this side, so there's 3.3 volt, there's 5 volt, there's a couple of grounds. I have A to D's here. These are 10-bit A to D's. I have uh, on the Arduino Due, which is the new Cortex-M based platform, it has a 12-bit A to D. Uh, I have uh, PWMs, everyone that has this little dash on it, that's a PWM capable line. Uh, we can use PWM as an analog output. So if you understand how voltages work, if I could have a voltage at zero volts and five volts, and if I switch that voltage on and off fast enough, I can average to any voltage in between just by changing the duration of how long I have it at five volts versus how long I have it at zero volts. So this is how we approximate analog output using PWM signals. So if you've ever seen an LED that kind of goes bright and dim, bright and dim, that's PWM. So you've seen it, you just may not notice that you knew what you were looking at. Uh, these are digital IOs on this side. They can be either inputs or outputs. Uh, these, uh, this particular platform has two interrupts coming in. And uh, we're starting to see this particular pinout being used in a lot of different places. So here we have the Arduino tray board. This hasn't been released yet. Uh, I'm on the beta for this. Uh, we have a, uh, this is a BeagleBone Black right here, and that's an Arduino Leonardo chip. So this is the Atmel 32U4 processor on one board. So it's got Ethernet, it's got USB. Um, you can then plug in shields into it, or you can plug in capes uh, if you want to use capes on that. Uh, here's the Udu board. So that's a one gigahertz Citara. Um, this Udu board uses the IMX6. So Freescale IMX6, you can get it in a single, dual, or quad core version. And right in there is a Cortex M3 that happens to run Arduino's software. So you have a serial connection from the Cortex, um, this one, the, the IMX6, into the Cortex M3, and then we have the Arduino pinouts. This, by the way, this extra stuff here, this is the Arduino Mega pinout. So it uses the Arduino standard pinout and then adds a whole bunch of extra cir circuits to it. It has 54 digital IOs instead of uh, 14. Uh, we see the Intel Galileo board. This one is a Quark processor. Uh, it runs Linux natively. It does not run the Arduino code, but they have an Arduino IDE that Intel has ported to it. So it uses the same pinout so we can use the same shields. Uh, this one, I think, is 5-volt compatible. Um, a couple of others. This one is a, uh, an embedded x86 with an Arduino Mega pinout. There's the Gertduino board. So this is a standard Arduino chip uh, with a plug-over module that plugs into the Raspberry Pi, uh, which is a nice little alternative. Again, it has the same pinouts. And then there's the Arduino Due, which is an, a Mega pinout plus the uh, Cortex M3. Um, nice processors, they give you a lot of capability and we're seeing a lot more of this, okay, nobody can really outdo what the ecosystem, what the Arduino ecosystem has been able to generate. So people are basically saying, screw it, I'll just combine Arduinos with my platform and we'll go from there. So uh, this is the basic layout. We've got 14 digital IOs on this board six analog inputs, uh, one UART, JTAG, and two 8-bit uh, timers, one 16-bit timer. Uh, we also have some interrupts associated with this. Uh, the Mega goes from 14 digital IOs to 54 digital IOs. Again, all of this is open source. You can download the Gerbers, make changes, and send it off to a fab house, and within two days, you'll have new boards back based on all of this circuitry that you didn't really have to do anything in order to make a new board. Uh, we had, of course, they do have the plug overs for both uh, Ethernet and Wi Fi, so we can get some pretty decent connectivity out of this. The Android ADK, which is the accessory development kit, 
This was introduced by Google in 2011, and it was originally designed as a, a USB connection between an Arduino, and it turns out a yo-yo board, a PIC24 board, uh, into Android. And we actually see it, it's actually being deployed today, in a lot of exercise equipment, where you plug your smartphone into the exercise machine, and then it keeps track of where you are in San Francisco, so you can actually ride you could ride the Tour de France, for instance, with one of these things. Uh, and it changes the elevation of the bike as you're going up, down, up and down hill. It changes the amount of tension that it takes in order to pedal. Uh, all that's being done by an external microprocessor. It's not being done by the Android side. But the Android side is being used to visualize what's happening. They did release in 2012 ADK2. Uh, it added support for the Cortex-M3. Uh, so that's a fairly powerful processor in its own right. Um, but it turns out the ADK is really just a protocol specification. Every Android device since Gingerbread has shipped with the ADK libraries. So it's something that's available in any Android device if you just simply plug it in. It'll automatically detect the device and say, hey, you've just plugged in an accessory. Would you like for me to download the APK? And you can actually specify a website that it will go to the website, download the APK, and sideload it into the system if you've allowed for external uh, downloads. Uh, it has been ported to the Ram Raspberry Pi, by the way. Uh, that was actually at Embedded Linux Conference, actually the Android Builder Summit last year. Um, this individual, Gary, he uh, announced what he'd done. He had ported the ADK over to the Raspberry Pi. So now you have Android and you have a Linux front end which, I don't know, seems a little counterproductive, but nonetheless, it was kind of a cool thing. So Android, of course, has an issue when we deal with USB uh, because Android devices are expected to be devices, not hosts. So when we plug in an external microprocessor, the microprocessor has to behave as a USB host. And that normally requires some additional circuitry in order to make that happen. So the USB, on the other hand, once you're plugged in and you've got the established connection, it just looks like a serial port stream. So you're just simply writing messages back and forth. It just happens to be packetized messages over the USB. It does not run USB isochronous mode. It runs normal USB transfer mode. Bluetooth, of course, very, very popular. And you'll see that most of the connections that exist right now between Android and Arduinos, almost always done with Bluetooth. That's the one thing that everybody could guarantee was always going to be there. Yeah. With this concept, is there a uh, provision for being able to pull that APK over that, that USB interface? Let's say that you're in an environment where you don't have Wi-Fi or cellular. Um, not that I'm aware of, but it certainly wouldn't be a hard extension. So that's a good idea. I mean, we see that in some cases with USB modems where you plug the USB modem in and it becomes a, a storage device temporarily so that you can then install things. So it would have to be something like that. But yeah, it's an interesting concept and I, I think it wouldn't be too difficult to make it happen, but I haven't seen anybody who's done it. Um, when they came out with the ADK version 2, they also added uh, audio support, the A2DP uh, profile. Um, again, works just like a serial port, behaves like a serial port, it just happens to be wireless. Oh, they also support Bluetooth Low Energy, which is the now, now called Bluetooth Smart, because Bluetooth Low Energy wasn't descriptive enough. Now it's Bluetooth Smart, which is more descriptive. I heard it just called Bluetooth 4. No, oh, oh, you're way out of date. <laughs> Bluetooth 4 became Bluetooth Low Energy, because 4 wasn't impressive enough. And then they renamed it to Bluetooth Smart because Bluetooth Low Energy told people too much. Oh, uh, marketing <laughs> upgrades. Marketing upgrades, exactly. Um, Wi-Fi, if we happen to have uh, the Wi-Fi uh, plug over the shield, uh, it actually has its own little web server built into it. So all the TCP IP and UDP traffic is actually offloaded to the Wi-Fi interface. So the little 8-bit microprocessor doesn't really do anything except talk to the Wi-Fi interface across um, the I squared C interface. So here's an example of what that code would look like. Most of this is print lines. We just set your serial IP, your IP address, and then down here we're doing a UDP begin packet, 
and then we're writing the UDB packet, and we're saying to finish the packet, and then the UDB packet goes out. So it's pretty easy to work with uh, if you decided you wanted to use sockets. And the same thing between Wi-Fi and Ethernet interfaces. They both have the same basic uh, source. So we find ourselves in a situation where there are a lot of options that are available to us. The biggest problem that we're going to have to address here is we have to be able to partition our problem space so that we understand what parts have timing constraints and or electrical constraints and what parts are we trying to get and use Android for. If we're trying to use Android for the user interface, we're trying to use Android to print pretty pictures, uh, we want to be able to have a service guy walk up to an industrial control device, plug his smartphone into the industrial control device and have the industrial control then tell the smartphone, hey, I'm fine, uh, although this PWM seems to be acting up a little bit. Those kinds of diagnostic messages and things of that sort, that's easily done uh, using Android as the front end and then one of these other microcontrollers I've been talking about is the back end. Um, allowing those to do the real-time work and simply offload all of the real-time constraints and the electrical constraints off of the Android handset. But by adding this microcontroller, now we have the decisions that we need to make. Are we going to use Fermata? Are we going to use, are we going to actually program the microcontroller? If we're going to program the microcontroller, we have to buy into that religion and uh, figure out exactly how that's going to be done with the IDEs, et cetera. But fortunately, we have a bajillion, and that's a technical term, uh, connectivity options that are available to us. Whether it's Bluetooth, serial, USB, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, mesh networks, we have, uh, you know, the 802.15.4. Uh, basically, whatever connectivity we want to use is driven by our application and its communication constraints. So uh, if, for those of you who are interested, this afternoon I have my uh, Android, I mean, excuse me, building a Linux-based robot, uh, which uses a lot of this stuff. And then tonight at the, uh, at the Birds of a Feather demo showcase, I've got my little robot, and we'll actually try and drive it around, if everything works okay. <laughs> my, uh, I, I want only the freshest code for you guys, so I'm still working on the app. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So I just I don't work for this company. I just want to do mention that there is something called Arduino that's a highly uh, not extending page or right uh, part. If you use it, it's, it's great. You want it yeah. Um, you know, actually, it turns out that Atmel bought the Arduino line from Nordic Semiconductor, and so it was actually a couple of guys at Nordic that had created it, and uh, it's actually it's it's really been a, a tremendous success. Uh, the Arduino community was actually built uh, specifically to enable non-engineers to do engineering kinds of things. So we'll, uh, I have another presentation later in the week where we get into the details of Arduino and how it interfaces to Linux, and we actually take a look at some of those characteristics and how you talk to the, between the devices, what the code looks like. It's an incredibly simple interface. Um, that's one of the reasons why Arduinos are such a popular processor type. Uh, they're dirt cheap, and um, you can get them uh, very, very small. I mean, smaller than the size of your pinky uh, for a surface mount part. And it's an 8-bit processor. It's got its limitations. But if you need interrupt driven, you need PWM, you need digital IOs, it does all that stuff. And there's a simple environment, an ecosystem with lots of examples out there on the Internet to help you. And that's really the key. That's why Arduino continues to exist in light of boards like the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone Black. Those boards are actually cheaper than some of the Arduinos. But the Arduino exists because of the ecosystem. Yeah. So on the one board, the standard that you kind of didn't mention, but it's, uh, it's uh, embed. I don't know if mm. You don't have to install anything. It's yes. Put it down in the browser. Yeah, that's, a, that's another one. Uh, the embed processors, that's M-B-E-D. Um, the embed processors, there's also a bunch of um, applications out on the uh, Play Store for embed. So that's another, that's another complete, almost completely separate track on microcontrollers. So yeah, that's also out there. Mm -mm. Now that one, uh, well, actually I think they do have something similar to Fermata for embed. Uh, 
Yeah. It, it's more, uh, yeah, believe me, Arduinos are not where they are because of their capabilities. They're there because they are easy to understand and there's an ecosystem that supports it. And the ecosystem kicks ass. Both in hardware and software, yeah. And they were there first. I mean, you know, this, this is kind of at the heart of the maker movement. So a lot of your, um, uh, your uh, uh, 3D printers and things of that sort will use Arduinos inside of them to control the 3D printers, all the stepper motors and everything. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, from what I've gathered so far is that the format I'm on, uh, in some ways, is like uh, follows the command and control uh, mechanism, like when it's coming, to, like when it's interacting. Yeah, all the command and control is moved over to the Android side with Fermata. So when we have, like, when all the command and control has been moved off to the Android side, uh, I mean, how are we really, how are we really solving the uh, real time problem? You're not. Um, you're only solving the connectivity problem because we can't wire a PWM out of an Android handset. We're just getting past the electrical problem. It does not solve the real-time constraint problem. That's correct. Are you, are you going to be touching upon how we are planning to solve the RD problem? Or? Yes. Well, that's what we were talking about back up here where we actually program the, uh, the micro, well, should we program or use Fermata? And the real-time constraints, if you have real-time constraints, you have to program the microcontroller. No, no question about that. Okay, that's it. Thank you.